Thank you. So, uh, shall I jump right in? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this, uh, this all started with a tweet. Someone had asked Elon Musk, what is next after Starship? Would the next thing be slightly larger? His answer was the next thing would be twice the diameter and twice the height. That's huge. Um, space Starship is already larger than a 7.5. Twice, twice the diameter and twice the height means eight times the volume. Launching that from Earth, I do not believe would be safe. A Saturn 1B had a problem with vibration breaking windows in nearby buildings. That's why the launch pad for Saturn 5 had a water deluge system for sound suppression. Water also cooled the launch pad so that heat from the rocket exhaust didn't break down concrete of the launch pad. An explosion on launch would produce massive damage. Press gallery for launch complex 39 was built three miles from the launch pad. I believe Starship is already as large as can be practically launched from the surface of the Earth. Anything larger would have to be built in space. So there are several advantages to uh, doing this. Uh, no heat shield because it's not going to be entering uh, planetary atmosphere, no aerodynamic uh, forces or control surfaces, no landing system, and it can have specific features designed for in-space use that are not compatible with atmospheric entry. And the radiation mitigation system can uh, be designed so it's not compromised for atmospheric entry. Uh, a wheel shape allows artificial gravity for the entire trip. I started uh, calculating radius for uh, Mars level gravity. At 2 RPM, the ship would be too big. At 4 RPM, too small. But 3 RPM was about just right. Radius for Mars gravity at the surface of the floor of just one deck. That's 37.6992 meters uh, using mean surface gravity of Mars to six significant figures. Uh, with a 14 meter wide ring and 2.43 meter or eight foot high ceiling that works out to the same volume as that large ship that Elon talked about. But when I worked out details, adding cabins the same size as third class from the age of steamships, the ring became 19 meters wide. Then add an observation deck with transparent walls and ceiling, zero-g hub for sports, zero-g cargo hold. Um, okay, the ship grew. Um, for scale, the central hub uh, the spokes are attached to is nine meters diameter for the what you're seeing right now. Uh, that means the central hub is the same size as SpaceX Starship. This ship is designed for a thousand passengers and uh, 66 crew, or between 60 and 66 crew. If every cabin were packed with the maximum number of passengers, the ship's capacity would be 1,600 passengers, uh, and life support will be sized to allow that. However, the ship is not expected to ever carry that many. A uh, thousand passengers is enough. <clears throat> this will not compete with Starship. This replaces the large thing that Elon said would come after Starship. This is actually dependent on Starship. The ship that will be built in Earth orbit traveled from um, Earth orbit to Mars orbit and back. It will need something to carry passengers from the surface of Earth to Earth orbit to deliver them to this ship. The most logical vessel to do that is the passenger version of SpaceX Starship. Another ship will be permanently placed on Mars, used to transport passengers from Mars down to the surface after all. Starship is designed to travel all the way to Mars on its own, just have one of them left on Mars. Furthermore, the cargo version of Starship will be needed to lift components for construction, and the propellant version of Starship will be needed to lift propellant to fuel this big thing. Uh, orienting the rear end of this ship towards the sun is important to, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the sunward wall of the habitation ring will be a water wall. This will be the tank for drinking water and life support. The entire habitation ring will be protected, making the entire deck a giant radiation shelter. That means all cabins, all washrooms, all dining rooms, all kitchens, the bar, the bridge, even the laundry, the central hub and the upper deck of the ring will have to be evacuated during a solar proton event. To make this clear, a 2.43 meter or eight foot high tall water wall protects the entire 19 meter wide width of the ring. That's shadow shielding. 
This requires very careful orientation to the sun. Of course, another reason is sunlight. Solar arrays will dangle outward from the sunward end of the ring, converting sunlight to electricity, and the sunward wall will be covered with reflectors to light pipes. This is a top view of one section of the habitation ring. The top and bottom of this image are the outer hull of the habitation ring, the top towards the sun. Uh, that wall uh, has the water wall. Uh, windows on the sunward side would have multiple panes, uh, space between panes filled with mineral oil for radiation shielding. Since the window will uh, puncture through the water wall, uh, the bottom of this image would be the far side aimed towards deep space. Windows on that side would have air between panes. Ships at sea are broken into watertight compartments. This ship has multiple pressure tight compartments. Each pressure compartment separated into two sub compartments with a pressure uh, bulkhead. If a meteor punctures a hole into one sub compartment, it can be sealed off. Emergency oxygen can maintain pressure briefly, hopefully long enough for passengers to evacuate before pressure doors close. An emergency airlock made of heavy plastic sheet can be affixed to any pressure door with wall anchors to hold the airlock open uh, with all air pumped out. This would allow crew to enter in spacesuits to remove any passengers trapped after pressure doors close. Ships at sea have lifeboats. Lifeboats don't make sense for an interplanetary ship. The ship is on an interplanetary trajectory. Lifeboats would find they continue on their journey to Mars. Evacuating a large ship just deprives, deprives you of the resources of that ship. A ship at sea will sink to the bottom of the ocean where there is no air. Space has vacuum at all times. Lifeboats don't save you from that. Separating the ship into pressure type compartments means each compartment is a lifeboat. This image shows two corridors with four cabins on each side. Interior walls are not pressure tight. Each uh, sub compartment is roughly square. Each cabin will have primary life support, urine processor, water processor, and regenerable CO2 sorbent and oxygen generator. Water will be filtered to gray water. The water wall will cover the entire width of the pressure compartment with a bladder with two pockets. One pocket will hold possible water, the other gray water. A design student in the UK wrote a thesis for a shower with water recycler. Water down the drain goes to a cyclonic water filter, then a conventional filter, then back to the shower head. 70% of water down the drain comes right back out of the shower head. This reduces water consumption and energy to heat water. With the 30% wastewater would go to the water processor, gray water from the water processor would go to the gray water pocket of the water wall. This means total water volume in the water wall would not change. A unit on the roof of this compartment would uh, appear as a box on the floor of the upper deck. That, would, that unit would have final water filtration to convert gray water to potable. It would also have batteries to store po power from solar panels for that compartment air conditioning compressors, radiators on the outside surface of the ring would appear to be under the floor for passengers. Those radiators would be shaded by solar panels. Of course, every compartment would have, um, would be able to, uh, every compartment would be able to share water with the rest of the ship as well as share power. But in an emergency, each compartment could be sealed. Okay, standard cabins have, uh, furniture configuration in various ways. An economy cabin would be configured as third class cabin from the age of steamships. Steamships had four bunk beds, each with two bunks for a total of eight berths. No in cabin washroom, only public washrooms. This ship would replace one bunk bed with a small washroom about the size of an airline washroom plus shower stall. Outboard cabins would each have a window. A television set would cover the window, uh, configured to be transparent when turned off. Inboard cabins would just have a TV set. However, with 4K resolution flat screen TV that can receive streaming video from high definition cameras strategically uh, outside the ship, uh, TV would look very much like a suite. Uh, the suite has a window. Of course, the ship would have servers with a wide variety of movies and TV shows. Now, this is what I'm talking about. These are uh, cabins of current cruise ships. The uh, this shows you what it's going to be like. There are a few uh, 
The cabin to the lower left is the Ruby Princess used by Australia on February 2020 for COVID quarantine. Both end walls are all mirror, giving an infinite reflection effect. Uh, to the right is uh, uh, Royal Caribbean Liberty of the Seas. Notice the end tables. Nightstands are moved from the center aisle to the, uh, to the sides. These bunks are single beds, which are 30 inches by 75 inches. Bunks of an American aircraft carrier are 30 inches by 72 inches. So these are three inches longer. A queen size bed is 60 inches by 75 inches. So two single beds pushed together form a queen. The beds on this ship would come in only two sizes, single or queen berths. Lower berths would be mounted on tracks like a car seat. Cars can adjust the seat forward and back, but lock in place when you let go of the handle. Lower berths could slide sideways, but lock in place. Aircraft carrier berths have uh, a board supporting the mattress, but that can lift. Beneath the board, a storage compartment, uh, 10 centimeters or four inches deep. The storage compartment is separated into compartments because the side walls of the compartments support the board, ensuring it doesn't sag when a person is lying in bed. Effectively, the storage compartment is a truss. Uh, beneath uh, lower berths would be two rows of drawers, one row for the passenger in the upper berth, one in the lower um, drawers in the upper uh, Upper mattress could be locked. Uh, drawers, uh, anyway, drawers and the under mattress storage could, could be locked. Upper berths could fold into the wall. Passengers would have the option of choosing furniture. They could have the third bunk bed removed, the one across from the washroom. Um, price for the cabin would be the same, but removing the third bunk bed would allow a chair and floor space for luggage. This is what uh, a Navy berth looks like. There are three berths high. I'm saying two berths high because you need room for uh, the drawers, but that's the under bunk, uh, under bunk storage that I was talking about. Here's an example from a real cruise ship. Um, this is an alternate furniture configuration using a Murphy bed uh, instead of bunk beds. Uh, we would want the, the toilet and shower on the same side of the door uh, for standardization, but this shows uh, you can uh, an alternate configuration that gives you more room. One of the things with a Murphy bed, there are Murphy beds today that can support a desk. The desk remains flat and level when you pull the bed down, and when you push it back up, uh, anything that was on the desktop stays on the desktop. The um, the ship can also have a few luxury suites. One pressure compartment is what I've envisioned for luxury suites. The compartment will have two cabins. Each cabin can be uh, subdivided by portable walls, technically known as operable wall partitions. Standard cabins are 2.4 meters wide by four meters long. Luxury cabins can be divided into club cabins that are 2.4 meters wide by eight meters long because club cabins have twice the floor space. Anyway, um, so these can be subdivided. A uh, couple example uh, portable walls, in case anybody wonders what those, what I'm talking about. Uh, here's a few examples from existing cruise ships. So the one large cabin can be just uh, a royal suite uh, or configured like that, uh, or half of the uh, compartment can be an owner's suite or divided in half again as a premium suite or divided in half again for a club suite. So that there are various options available depending on how much money people have to buy a suite or buy a ticket for a suite. Uh, bridge for this ship would be a room in the habitation ring. Uh, this is a cross section of uh, the habitation ring showing it's got two decks, uh, the cabins and the corridors. Um, again, radiators on the outside of the ring to radiate heat. Uh, on, the sunward, on the sunward side, you've got uh, uh, reflectors to collect sun into light pipes. The, uh, uh, some facilities on board the ship. This ship could have uh, dining rooms. I'm visualizing a main dining room that is buffet rather than waiters that has 300 seats, two uh, medium-sized dining rooms with 50 seats each and fine dining room with 20 seats each and a waiter, uh, a bar that's configured as a brew pub, a gymnasium, the observation deck, 
uh, one room on the upper deck could be configured as a Mars simulation room that has the same atmospheric pressure, uh, gas mixture, and same temperature as Mars during the day. And considering you're going to have the same gravity as Mars, uh, this would make a very realistic Mars simulation room so that passengers could put on a spacesuit and go into the Mars simulation room to practice what it's like to you know, wear a spacesuit on the surface of Mars. Um, astronomy. Uh, on the observation deck, I'm thinking of a uh, having a telescope that's got a polar mount. Uh, the polar mount or uh, equatorial mount, sorry, the correct term is equatorial mount, um, is designed to counter the rotation of Earth's rotation on board a ship with RPM of 3 RPM. Uh, the uh, equatorial mount for this will be a little more involved, uh, but amateur astronomers could observe the stars. They're going to have the best view of the sky ever. Uh, at least one telescope should have a digital uh, image sensor that... Um, will be available to all passengers on the ship using Wi-Fi. Uh, so their tablet, their smartphone, uh, whatever device uh, they have, even the, the large screen TV in their cabin could be used to observe through this telescope and uh, passengers could control the telescope uh, remotely from wherever they are on the ship. Um, eight hour shifts. Uh, the, I would ask the passengers to set their clocks, whether it's your wristwatch, smartphone, et cetera, to one of three time zones. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, Pacific Standard Time, or China Standard Time, that's just simply UTC plus zero hours, minus eight hours, or plus eight hours. If they don't want to set their time zone to China Standard Time, there's always uh, Western Australia Standard Time, uh, Malaysia, et cetera. All of these are just UTC plus eight hours, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the point is to have a third of the passengers in one of the three uh, shifts so that we uh, limit how many passengers are trying to use the dining room at any given time. So we don't have to have dining rooms that can uh, seat all 1,000 passengers at once. Uh, the dining rooms would offer food service, breakfast from 6 a.m., so 8 a.m., uh, lunch from noon to 2, supper from 6 to 8 p.m. For each dining room, what that really means is during each eight-hour shift, uh, lunch is served from noon to 2. Breakfast, which is intended for one of the other time zones, would be from 2 to 4. No food service for two hours, and then supper from 6 to 8. Um, so the uh, passengers uh, will be able to use the dining rooms for meeting rooms uh, when there's no food service. Um, and we won't restrict uh, what times you can go to, to the dining room to eat a meal. You can go to the dining room anytime you want, but by setting their clocks to different time zones, it encourages uh, passengers to, to spread this out so that it's, it's effective. Um, using robots to bust tables. That means um, cleaning the tables off, uh, cleaning away the dirty dishes and cleaning a table for the next passenger. This reduces the number of crew members uh, gymnasium, two decks. Now, this would be the only room that's got two decks. Uh, the upper deck would have to be off limits during a radiation storm. That is a solar proton event, whether it's a solar flare or coronal mass ejection, uh, because only the uh, lower deck is going to be radiation shielded. As for food, most food, uh, dry, frozen, canned, stored food. But uh, we can have a small aquaponics system on the upper deck with greenhouses to grow vegetables and a, uh, a small aquarium to raise uh, fish for, uh, for food. Uh, this allows for uh, some fresh, uh, at least a salad bar that's got fresh vegetables. Um, bread would be baked on board, pasta is cooked. Most food is cooked in the kitchens allowing for uh, long-term storage of food but also by reducing the amount of water that's in stored food. So water is going to be from recycled water. Oxygen generator. At the 2004 Mars Society Convention, I gave a presentation about a chloroplast oxygen generator. I don't want to go over the whole thing again. Short version, in vitro chloroplasts uh, harvested from leaves of a plant are placed in a bag of sterile water. Uh, re reverse osmosis filter uh, of the water to make sure it's clean. CO2 and uh, water converted by the chloroplast into oxygen and carbohydrates, which 
plant you harvest the chloroplast from determines what type of carbohydrate. The easiest one to harvest chloroplast is a pea, the leaves of a pea plant. So that would produce pea starch. So you'd have starch as a byproduct instead of toxic gases that have to be dumped in space. Starch can be placed in a tank with an enzyme called amylase to break it down into sugar. So we can make white sugar on the ship. Another tank could grow mold on some more starch that actually produces that amylase. So even the amylase doesn't have to be stored. It can be made on board the ship. Booze, yeah, if we're talking about a ship with a thousand passengers, um, there it's, it's basically a six month cruise to Mars. Um, they're going to get bored and they are going to want some entertainment. We can actually boo brew the booze on board. When I said brew pub, uh, a brew pub has the fermentation vessels right behind the bar. Um, so for example, with beer, um, a home beer kit, you've got 1.7 kilograms net weight of malt that can make 23 liters of beer. Uh, the rest is water and sugar, but that can be made on board the ship. Wine can be made with grapefruit juice concentrate. So that reduces the mass that we need to carry. Again, the rest is water and sugar. Um, vodka is made from just water and sugar that is fermented and distilled uh, using uh, yeast and uh, yeast nutrient. Um, rum is made from molasses, so you need molasses. Um, the rest is, again, water and sugar produced on board the ship. Gin, we can actually have some plants in the observation deck as potted plants, uh, such as gin, harvest the juniper berries and botanicals so that we can actually convert vodka and those berries into gin so we can actually make gin on board the ship. So again, the point here is to reduce how much we have to carry. Whiskey is more difficult. It's made from, it's made like beer using uh, distiller's yeast instead of beer yeast, but it has to be aged for years in charred oak uh, to give it its distinctive color and flavor. That's not really practical to do on board the ship, but these others could be. Um, processing urine. Uh, the, uh, this ship can get into some advanced life support. Uh, actually, uh, Electrolysis of human urine to uh, extract uh, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide, further uh, electrolysize it again to separate the sodium from the potassium. Uh, when you combine uh, sodium hydroxide with chlorine and hydrogen, it actually forms salt, which can then be boiled down to create salt uh, that can be used for cooking. Um, if you add carbon dioxide to sodium hydroxide, it actually forms baking soda. So we can produce quite a bit on board the ship itself. Um, this is going to mean a toilet will need a urine collection tube like on the International Space Station. The toilet itself would be a bidet with no toilet paper. And the toilet would vacuum desiccate feces like the design that the Russians had designed for Mir 2. Um, grinding up the dry desiccated feces into a powder that would just be stored for Disposal, um, actually kept on board the ship until we get to Mars, because that would be valuable organic fertilizer for the greenhouses on Mars. But we'd have to make sure that people are, are taught carefully to um, urinate in the tube uh, because uh, urinating in the toilet bowl would gum up the, uh, the works and we need the urine because it's a valuable resource. Waste uh, collected from each uh, uh, cabin. Um, and some, uh, if we want to get into some advanced, really advanced stuff for advanced life support, uh, we can actually vat grow some microbes to produce oil used for cooking oil. Uh, we can, uh, actually add, uh, sodium hydroxide to that oil to make soap. So we could actually make soap, shampoo, laundry soap and dish soap on board the ship, uh, depending upon, um, you know, we'll have to do uh, mass calculations of how much mass that'll take, but uh, the upper level of the ship, the, the greenhouse level, uh, we'll have to, uh, this can actually be done on board a ship that's this size. Uh, but again, the, the, the goal here is to reduce how much weight we have to carry with us from Earth by doing what is practical to do on board the ship. And microbial oil is already commercially available. Um, there's another type of oil to replace uh, palm oil. If that 
Now, I'm not sure whether that would be practical, but if it is practical, combining the two types of oil can be used to make margarine. And the uh, urine can be further processed to create yeast nutrient. Oh, there's five minutes left. And questions.